This lecture and your assigned reading are the foundation of your discussion post for this module. As usual, I put the sources I'll mention on Canvas at the To Learn More link. In this lecture, we're going to talk about editorial comments and author queries. First, we'll explore the editor-author relationship then move on to describing editorial comments and queries. And then I'll finish by explaining some principles for their effective use. So let's start with exploring the editor-author relationship. Remember that I've referred to the editor as an intermediary who works between the author or creator of the content the audience for the content, and also the commissioning body, so whether that's a news publisher or an organizational publisher. The relationship between editor and author is a little different depending on whether the commissioning body or the author is paying for the editor's services. For example, I once had a position editing veterinary research papers and grant proposals. The commissioning bodies, or publishers, included a range of research journals and funding agencies, but I never met anyone at these commissioning bodies, and I had no obligations to them. I only knew the authors, and their supervisor who paid me. On the other hand, I also worked as a research journal editor, where I represented the commissioning body, IEEE. Although I knew some individual authors, I was paid by the publisher, and was ultimately obliged to produce quality content for them. It was easiest to maintain positive relationships with the authors at the vet school. A majority of horror stories about the editor-author relationship involve traditional publishing. As a reminder, that means mostly publishers of books or research journals. In the 2018 podcast, Carol Saller, who's the author of The Subversive Copy Editor and a contributing editor to the Chicago Manual of Style, says that editors' egos are the number one reason for editor-author relationship trouble. One of my goals in this course is to help you develop a healthy editorial ego. Let me use a story about the editor-author relationship in traditional publishing to demonstrate how relationships go wrong. Richard Aiden, a longtime freelance editor, blogged about the unwritten or unacknowledged rules surrounding the editor-author responsibilities and how those impact their relationship. So here's the story he recounts. Aiden was hired by the commissioning body or publisher to, to copy edit a 400-page book manuscript on specialized financing within eight work days. He was not hired to do structural or developmental editing or proofreading. The publisher sent the copy edits to the author, who did some more editing, and then they printed the book. It wasn't clear if the book was proofread after typesetting. You probably won't be surprised to hear that critics of the book complained about a lack of editing or proofreading, as well as about the book's comprehensibility. The author demanded that the publisher reprint the book, so the publisher asked Aiden to review the author's complaints. One specific sentence was mentioned by a critic. Aiden explains what he found when looking back at his records. It turns out the copy-edited version that we submitted differs from the version that was printed. The author rejected one of the editor's suggested changes to the sentence and made a couple of additional changes we knew nothing about. There's evidence that the relationship within non-traditional publishing environments is not highly adversarial. In 2006, some TechCom research by Eaton and her colleagues surveyed more than 400 authors to find out about their relationship with the technical editors they worked with. The good news is that 76% said their relationship was good or better. The two things the authors most liked about working with their tech editors included, first, more than half mentioned that it improved the end product or the technology that they were working on. Second, around one quarter of them said collaborating early in the process saved them time later. Just under one fifth had no negative experiences to report at all. While most of the authors said they respected the editor's ability to help them create quality content, there is a little bad news. There were some common complaints about working with their tech editors, like around one quarter of the authors said the edits were poor quality. They mentioned things like lack of clarity, uselessness, inaccurate grammar or punctuation, lack of knowledge about the appropriate style guide, etc. 
They also mentioned the edits represented the editor's personal style or the editor over-edited. Some of the complaints about edits included harshness, being too nitpicky, changing the meaning. In another article, Lanier reported some of the same complaints from the authors he worked with as an editor at a large government research lab. A quote from one of the authors appears on this slide. This suggests even well-meaning editors may be perceived negatively. I'll mention here that the primary way Lanier and his fellow editors addressed poor editor-author relationships at their lab was through the adoption of electronic or on-screen editing. We'll talk about this at length in future modules. Ultimately, Aiden made the point that the responsibility for content quality is always shared. Problematic author tried to place responsibility solely with the editor but the editor's responsibilities were constrained by the decisions the author and commissioning party made. Remember those triple constraints. The scope of the editorial work in Aiden's situation was constrained to the copy editing level of edit, when the material really needed structural editing and proofreading. The time for copy editing was constrained to eight days. So as a professional and a business person, Aiden wisely charged the publisher for an eight-day copy edit that didn't achieve the level of quality the author expected. There are two lessons I want you to get from Aiden's story. The first is to make the responsibilities of the author and editor as explicit as possible before beginning any editing project. You can do this in part by referring to the levels of edit in a contract or some other type of agreement. The second lesson is never take responsibility for the overall level of content. Instead, take responsibility for the appropriate level of quality given the constraints you were asked to work within. At this point, I need to make sure you understand the basics of the publication process. This is a bit of a challenge because it's somewhat different depending upon what type of materials being published and whether we're talking about traditional or non-traditional publishers. Here's a graphic of the process that's fairly general because it comes from a vendor that's selling a system for managing a publishing process. Notice that it's divided into three stages. Editors are involved in the first stage, pre-production, when conducting a structural edit or a copy edit. Editors are involved in the second stage, that's production, when reviewing proofs after material has been typeset or otherwise designed for its ultimate presentation. Finally, editors can also be included in what this graphic calls the electronic stage, when material is made ready for digital delivery, but there wouldn't be much interaction with authors at that stage. To systematically monitor and evaluate content quality, editors communicate to authors during the first and second stages, when content's developed, organized, reviewed by stakeholders, and edited against standards, and then designed for its final presentation to an audience. Now that you know a little more about the relationship between editors and authors, it's time to talk about comments and queries. During pre-production, a structural editor might write a letter to an author or sometimes add marginal comments in the Microsoft Word file containing the material being edited. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, the editor's recommendations could be delivered either in writing or orally. Also during pre-production, a copy editor suggests more direct and specific edits. Once upon a time, those suggestions would be done with red pencil on hard copy. Today, those suggestions are typically added with track changes in Microsoft Word or another authoring system. This is called inline copy editing. Note that what you're seeing in this final example shows the interaction between editors and authors. In any effective publication process, the editor's copy edits are sent back to the authors, and perhaps other stakeholders, for review. The editor's changes show up in red, in this example, while the authors, that was me in this case, are in blue. If you look, you can see that I also added a comment in the margin about why, as an author, I didn't accept one of the editor's recommendations. Because editors must sometimes explain why they've suggested copy edits, they add editorial comments because they must sometimes ask authors questions in order to determine how best to achieve content quality, they add author queries 
Let's look at examples of these in more detail. Here are two examples of editorial comments at the level of copy editing. These come from an actual study of student editorial comments done by our own Dr. Bedker. I should mention that editors often use the abbreviation AU to make it clear that a comment is directed toward an author. There are other abbreviations to use when an editor makes comments that are directed to other individuals involved in the publishing process. The top comment explains why the editor suggests deleting material. The bottom comment is a compliment to the author. Effective editors, especially those who've been involved in a structural edit, praise authors for effective choices and improvements to previous versions of the material. Because both examples are attached directly to specific elements in the material being edited, but are not the actual copy edit, they're most appropriately placed in the margins. This is a typical author query happening during a copy edit. It comes from a blog post at American Editor, which is run by Richard Aiden, whom I mentioned earlier. In this query, Aiden asked the author if the usage of IE is accurate. He also explains why EG might be what the author actually means. Although queries could be entered inline as markup, they typically appear in margin notes like this. Before we move on to talking about how to write effective comments and queries, I want to say a few words about their effect on authors. That'll help me tie them back to the editor-author relationship. Eaton's research, which was mentioned earlier in this lecture, found that the hundreds of authors they surveyed who worked with tech editors were influenced mainly by three things. The amount of time available matters. All those triple constraints again. When there's time pressure on the author, they're less likely to adopt editor's suggestions. The second thing that matters is organizational hierarchy. Although the authors were pretty likely to accept suggestions, that adoption level was highest if editors were their supervisor, a little lower if they were co-workers or subordinates or individuals from outside their own department. As an aside, the clearer hierarchy of editors over authors in a non-traditional publisher might explain why their relationship appears to be a little less combative than in traditional publishers. The third thing that matters is the content or focus of the comment or suggestion. Authors are most likely to adopt suggestions about grammatical errors. They're a little less likely to adopt style edits, even when they agree that the edit would improve the quality of the content. And even less likely to adopt structural, that would mean content or organization edits. They're least likely to adopt style edits that they don't agree with. All of this means that editors who want to make comments and queries that are effective have to be strategic and skilled in their use. That brings us to the third and final topic in this lecture, how to use comments and queries effectively so that authors adopt what editors suggest. Before I begin, I should say that I'm using the word suggest purposefully here. The bulk of an editor's work for both traditional and non-traditional publishers is influencing rather than dictating what an author does with their material. First, we'll consider principles for deciding when to use comments or queries. Your assigned reading for this module is a summary of a presentation by an editor named Shelley Potler at a meeting of the Council of Science Editors. I've listed Potler's guidance about when to query on this slide. Consider a couple of examples in which I've used lorem ipsum, actually hipster ipsum, as placeholder text. Imagine a copy editor suspects that the author misspelled Edgar Allan Poe's name but isn't sure. This is something the editor should simply look up and fix. There's no reason to ask the author. Or imagine the copy editor notices that the author has used British spelling. There's no need for a query if the author's work will be published in a research journal whose style guide dictates American English spelling. By the way, we'll be talking about style guides in the next module. To sum up, the when to comment principle means editors should comment or query only when what's missing or unclear can't be fixed by them easily and when the author actually has a choice.
Let's talk next about principles for determining where to provide your comments and queries. I've already mentioned that they can be communicated outside of the material being edited, for example, in a letter, but during copy editing, they are appropriately placed within the material. On this slide, I've summarized Aaron Brenner's guidance about where within material to query. It was posted on the website for ACES, another professional organization for editors. Her suggestions overlap with those in your assigned reading. So first, highlight the material your query addresses. And she says, highlight all of it, whether it's a character, a paragraph, or a table. If it's an entire section, make that clear in your query. Don't highlight material that's not relevant. And then second, write your concern in the margin. In this example, the editor appropriately highlighted only the material enclosed by parentheses. Before I leave the where to comment principle, I'll repeat that the authors in Eaton's study overwhelmingly preferred a conversation with an editor in addition to whatever written narrative or comments editors provided. As Brenner said, from the perspective of an editor, a five-minute phone call could replace an hour spent typing an email and an untold amount of time waiting for a response. Finally, we're going to consider principles for how to write comments and queries. This question has probably been answered more than any of the others. Your assigned reading for this module offers some guidance, which I've combined with a few other sources to create a list of four principles. The first is on this slide. Principle one has to do with making it easy for authors, but is mostly relevant to proofreading rather than the copy editing level of edit. The example I'm showing here uses a brief numbered mark within the material. On a separate sheet, the editor would list AU1 through AU3 and then include the entire comment there instead of in the margin. If you use this method, you'll also want to provide things like specific page numbers and possibly the line numbers so the author can easily find the relevant material. Once the material is typeset or otherwise in its final design, there's sometimes very little room to add comments in the margins. There's some advantage to the author to have a list of all editorial suggestions in one location. How to comment principle number two has to do with making it easier for authors to comply with your requests. In this case, however, it's about being clear. Brenner says it's important to ask a specific question. What do you want the author to do about the issue you've outlined? Can you offer a suggested revision? Guide the author along. Here's an example from Brenner that violates her advice. There's little possibility the author can read the editor's mind, even if the relevant material is highlighted. If the revision is related to the choice between IE and EG, then you should write that out. I'll talk about how to comment principles three and four together on this slide, because they're somewhat contradictory and best considered in tandem. On the one hand, writing the comment, add a visual here, all by itself would be concise and clear. On the other hand, adding readers understand and better remember visuals would be more tactful because it provides what Eaton calls a payoff statement. This part of the comment tells authors what they gain by adopting an editor's suggestion. The full comment, although longer, is more likely to establish a good relationship with the author. Let me discuss one more example highlighting how to comment principles three and four, especially because they're relevant to both copy editing and structural editing. Editors like to tell horror stories about the lack of tact in editorial comments. Of course, they're always talking about other editors. Here's one from Molly McCowan, writing on the ACES website. She gives two versions of the same comment. Clearly, the brevity of the top comment does not make up for its lack of tact. The bottom version is far better, despite its length. To summarize the main points of this video lecture, first I discuss the publishing process in order to help you better understand the relationship between editors and authors. And then I supplied some evidence that the relationship is sometimes problematic. Second, I showed you some examples of comments editors add to explain why they've suggested changes and queries they make to get authors to answer questions related to their recommendations. 
mostly during copy editing. Third, I explained some principles for writing effective comments and queries. There were two when to comment principles, a where to comment principle, and four how to comment principles. To close this lecture, let me repeat. I want you to develop a healthy editorial ego. I want you to be proud of what you know about creating quality content, but I also want you to respect boundaries, the boundaries of your knowledge and the boundary between editing and authoring. Appropriate boundaries are an important concept, so we're going to come back to them in future lectures. Mm -hmm.